The scripture reading today is from the Apostle Paul's letter to the Philippians. So then, my brothers and sisters, be glad in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to repeat the same thing to you, because they will help keep, on, keep you on track. Watch out for the dogs. Watch out for people who do evil things. Watch out for those who insist on circumcision, which is really mutilation. We are the circumcision. We are the ones who serve by God's spirit and who boast in Christ Jesus. We don't put our confidence in rituals performed on the body, though I have good reason to have this kind of confidence. If anyone else has reason to put their confidence in physical advantages, I have even more. I was circumcised on the eighth day. I am from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I am a Hebrew of the Hebrews. With respect to observing the law, I'm a Pharisee. With respect to devotion to the faith, I harass the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I'm blameless. These things were my assets, but I wrote them off as long as a loss for the sake of Christ. But even beyond that, I consider everything a loss in comparison with the superior value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. I have lost everything for him, but what I lost I think of as sewer trash, so that I might gain Christ and be found in him. In Christ I have a righteousness that is not my own, and that does not come from the law, but rather from the faithfulness of Christ. It is the righteousness of God that is based on faith, the righteousness that I have come from knowing Christ, the power of his resurrection and the participation in his sufferings. It includes being conformed to his death, so that I may perhaps reach the goal of the resurrection of the dead. It's not that I have already reached this goal or have already been perfected, but I pursue it, so that I may grab hold of this because Christ grabbed hold of me for just this purpose. Brothers and sisters, I myself don't think it reached it, I've reached it, But I do this one thing. I forget about the things behind me and reach out for the things ahead of me. The goal I pursue is the price of God's upward call in Christ Jesus. So all of us who are spiritually mature should think this way. And if anyone thinks differently, God will will reveal it to him or her. Only let's live in a way that is consistent with whatever level we have reached. The word of the Lord. Take a moment now for silent reflection. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this time to come together on this chilly day to gather near the warmth of who you are in the embrace of your spirit. And so we pray that um, you would be present with us, whether it is at home or some other remote space or here, of course, certainly as well, that your spirit would come and help us to clear away the things that clutter our hearts and our minds so that we might be fully present to what it is that you have to say to us today. So I ask God that you would speak through me because of me and also in spite of me, such that what it is that you want to do within each one of us and among us together might be made known and that we might be encouraged and strengthened to live into that however you lead. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When I first moved um, here to San Francisco a little over a month ago, one of the first things I noticed was the trash. I'd never seen anything like it. It wasn't just the cans on the side of the road, although that was unavoidable. It was how every home, restaurant, office, and even street corner had its version of the green, black, and blue bins that decorated the sidewalks of just about every street. And this devotion to composting, it's impressive. 
It wasn't long before I came to learn that in 2002, San Francisco adopted a goal of 75% diversion by 2010, and is well on its way to, um, to its bigger goal of zero waste. Zero waste. Can you imagine it? As an Enneagram 3, that just warms my heart. What does a world look like, even with absolutely no waste? I'm ashamed to admit that I'm a little bit challenged to picture what that looks like or how that works, really, even as I believe that it is possible. The kingdom of God looks like zero waste. And it's this idea of zero waste that came to mind as I was reflecting on our passage for today. Here, early Gentile Christians were contending with self-appointed gatekeepers of the faith in Philippi. This, you, this is, you might call, the, the early days of the church, if it could even be called church, at least in the ways that we have come to know it. A mishmash of people who had been captivated by the message and ministry of Jesus, moved by Paul's proclamation that this message wasn't just for the insiders, but for anyone who was compelled to follow in the, this new way way of being, who, who found hope in a message that the way things had been done wasn't the way things had to be. It had caught the ears and imaginations of such a strange cross-section of people. At some point, one wondered whether we were at a Dolly Parton concert. Regardless, it was a space and a way of being that drew people together who would normally never cross paths. And because the practices were still being kind of formed, the norms were still being um, worked out, the loudest and most confident voices were the ones that came through. Whether they meant well or not, the deeply ingrained message carried within their Jewish brethren that being part of God's promise required a concrete sign of commitment in the form of foreskin was challenging for the Gentiles. <laughs> Did a grown man really have to undergo the knife in order to be part of this new thing that was emerging? Yes, was the answer, accompanied by a shrug emoji. <laughs> Sorry, them's the rules. But then here comes Paul, walking in the room and seeing the knife at the ready. Wait, what? What the? <laughs> oh no, this is not happening. He's so upset, he nearly blows his yarmulke. You evildoers, you mutilators, he jabs at them with his finger. He uses Greek words that equate their efforts with the crude rituals of deformation that took place in Roman religious temples. But then he goes further, you, you dogs, he says. And here he employs a term uh, that we heard a couple of weeks ago that is so often used by Jews toward Gentiles who are considered ritually unclean. He turns it back on them. They are the unclean ones for turning a sacred ritual of promise into an obstacle to righteousness. And to be clear, Paul's issue isn't circumcision itself. He's fine if that's what people want to do. He gets it. He, too, has the ring of confidence. And yet, for all the confidence it may offer, it is not the ring of salvation. Listen, he asserts, in a very awkwardly worded theological declaration. We are the circumcision. Paul can't even, right? He remembers his blood pressure, his meditation practice. He takes three deep breaths. Okay, okay, I get it, I get it. You're trying to figure out how to make this thing work for you, but, like, this is not it. This is not what it's about. And instead of telling them that what defines our belonging and belovedness is not our adherence to performance, instead of giving them a theological blow-by-blow -blow of why prescriptive rituals, while helpful in many ways, is not the point, instead of all that, he tells his story. Listen. If there's anyone out there who could be theological bouncer, it's me. I've got all the receipts circumcised on the eighth day from the people of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin. I know this because of 23 and me. With respect to observing the law, I'm a Pharisee who is like the most hardcore. With respect to devotion of the faith, I harass the church. With respect to righteousness under the law, I am blameless. Listen, man, I was Teflon. Ain't nothing was going to stick to me. I worked my entire life to do all the right things in all the right order to get into all the right groups so that I could achieve all the right rewards. And I did it. I did it. But at the same time, it was trash. All of it. And it's at that point, maybe, when you hear it in his voice, the sadness at having done all the right things, but having been so very wrong about the perfection and position and pridefulness that had, instead of growing his message, 
had actually trapped his mind and shrunk his imagination for what was possible. Maybe he's thinking about Stephen, the bright young man who loved God and spoke powerfully about Jesus. The very same young man he watched with approval as he was put to death by hundreds of stone pelting that radiant face. Speaking of stones, who is he even to cast one? Maybe Paul is overcome with sadness at all the time he had wasted despair for all the harm he had caused. How do you even come back from that? How do you make up for so much damage? The truth is, you don't. You can't. Several years ago, I was taking a course on the psychology of business at Northwestern's Kellogg School, and it was here that I first heard about the concept of sunk cost fallacy. Do we have any MBAs in here? Sunk cost fallacy? I'd never heard the official term before, but as soon as I heard it explained, I knew it very well. Sunk cost fallacy occurs when a person is reluctant to abandon a strategy or a course of action because they have invested so heavily into it. Even when it's clear that abandonment would be much more beneficial, anyone who has gambled is familiar with this, just one more roll of the dice, right? Or as any, as any toddler who decides that they might be able to finally stick that fork into the outlet if they just lay down on the floor and scream harder, it is still not gonna happen. And the further you dig in, the worse it will be for everyone, yourself included. Paul knows about sunk cost fallacies. He's lived them far greater and deeper than he would like to admit. And so maybe as he faces his fellow Jewish siblings in the faith, all of this is running through his mind. And maybe Paul feels his righteous indignation melt into a kind of resignation, even settling into a sense of despair. Who am I even to say anything? And maybe he would have stayed there if he didn't know that this wasn't the end of his story. Maybe he would have closed his mouth, turned around, and walked away if he didn't think there was anything next. But he did know that there was something next. And he does know that this isn't the end of the story. With the realization that he had spent the majority of his life in pursuit in merits that actively undermined his spiritual health and led him to do terrible things in the name of God, even that isn't the end, the realization of it. In the most painful and powerful way possible, Paul had come to know that you can never go so far that you can't come back home. And so even as he raged against the unnecessary demands that his Jewish Christian brethren placed on their Gentile Gentile counterparts, he also had compassion. And with that compassion came perspective. God was as done with them as God had been as done with, done with him, which meant that God was not done at all, and they had work to do. Paul was there to get them free from the mindsets which had bound them up and held them back. And so I wonder for you today, what has bound you up? If you could turn back time, what would you change? What have you poured too much time, too much effort, too much energy in to let go, even as you know it is sinking you down, down, down? What do you need to release and write off so that you can pursue that for which Jesus has pursued you? Paul was inviting them as Jesus invited him, as Jesus invites us, to reconsider all of the things that they held on to that worked against their spiritual health, to let go of the sunk cost fallacy. Paul was calling them to escape the fallacy so that they could live, so that we can live with true freedom in Christ. And maybe, as he laid out his argument, Paul found that his own assurance of faith was strengthened. In Christ, I have a righteousness that it's not from the efforts of my own faith, as valiant as they may have been, he said, rather from the faithfulness of Jesus. My faith is not enough. It is the faithfulness of the one who took it all the way to the end and then came back to show me that it was possible to do it. It's not my faith that gets me anywhere. It's Jesus' faith on my behalf. 
And for all of the effort I put in since that fateful day on the road to Damascus, for all of the redirects I've utilized, I still have not reached the level of righteousness for which Jesus has called me, he says. But maybe that's the point, after all. That we haven't reached any achievement other than further movement in the direction of God's upward call through Jesus Christ. And he says, maybe in sharing my story, I can bring a few more folks along with me. And maybe, maybe it is in the pressing on and pressing forward, the pursuit of that which I have been grabbed hold of. Maybe that's the point, that I just keep trying. That I keep going on this journey and I reroute as, as the Spirit helps me understand that I'm getting off track. Because for all that I've relinquished and all that I've written off, for all the time I have wasted and effort I have squandered, Paul says, maybe even in all of that, there is no such thing, there is no such thing as sunk cost in God's economy. Everything is useful, even if it's trash. Everything is compost, even if it's rotting. In God's economy, we have reached zero waste. And so let us let go of all that holds us back. Let us notice our mistakes and missteps without despair or shame or self-flagellation. Let's allow ourselves to be graciously, gracefully redirected, to have the courage to acknowledge our culpability and the harm that we have done with all humility and right-making that is ours to offer. And then, and then let us press on with hope. Let us press on and press forward knowing that in God's economy, nothing is wasted. That in God's economy, there is no such thing as sunk cost. And that in God's economy, grace is the currency. And it doesn't cost a dime. Let's pray. God, we thank you that even as you don't let us off the hook, you don't keep us on the hook. That you invite us to come down with greater humility in our hearts, with a trust that even in our missteps, you make things right. And so help us to give over to that rather than sinking into despair, trusting and knowing that our hope is in you, a you who sees all of who we are and calls us still to press on with greater hope and trust and the knowledge that you are taking all of who we have been and repurposing it for your purposes in this world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.